Good evening. We're so glad that you could join with us here at Redeemer OPC to worship our God together. My name is Dan Adams. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, we'd love to get to know you more. Uh, there is, uh, we have a website uh, that we uh, can be reached through. We'd love to get to know you and uh, get to uh, know how we can be praying for you and encouraging you during this season. A few announcements as we get started. Uh, first, uh, a reminder that tonight is the very last time that you can send information for your graduates uh, to Tracy. Uh, we, we're looking for a picture, some information about uh, where they're graduating from, if they're graduating from, from college, uh, what uh, discipline they were in, and so we can put it together in a slideshow and show that at the beginning of our June 7th worship service in the morning. Uh, so please uh, get that information over to Tracy. We'd love to celebrate with you. Uh, as another announcement, this coming Wednesday, uh, we are having a Zoom prayer meeting. Uh, you can find more information about that in the, the bulletin uh, that online. Those are all our announcements for this evening. Uh, let's uh, draw near to our God uh, and hear from his word. This evening, our call to worship comes from Psalm 67, verses 1 through 3. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let's go to our God now and ask his blessing on the service. Our Lord and our God, we are grateful that we can come this evening and offer you praise. Lord, you have made us to glorify and enjoy you both now and for all eternity. And so we thank you, our God, that, that we can come as your people and offer you praise to glorify you and glorify your name, uh, both here on the earth and, and, and into all the rest of our lives, Lord. We pray that, that tonight we would also enjoy you, uh, that we would delight in your word, uh, that we would delight uh, in singing you praise. And Lord, we pray that you would fill us, uh, fill us uh, with your word, with your truth, with your peace, with your grace, that we might go out into the nations proclaiming your great name. And we pray these things, our God, in the name of our worthy Savior, Jesus Christ, amen.
We come to our God in a prayer of thanksgiving. Tonight's prayer is an adaptation of Psalm 103. Would you bow with me? O Lord, we praise you with all our soul. We praise you for the abundance of grace and mercy that we unconsciously receive from you in so many ways. You overlook our iniquities. You bring us back to good health. You save us from evil and inundate us with your love and compassion. Lord, you provide nourishment and rejuvenation to our bodies, minds, and souls. We also know, Lord, that through you there will be justice for the suffering of your people. Thank you for graciously revealing yourself to your children so long ago that we might have the privilege of knowing your will. We are only deserving of eternal death as a result of our rebellion. However, rather than eternally condemning your children in anger, you bestow your unconditional and boundless love on us. Through your incomprehensible love for us, you set us free completely from the price of our transgressions. We cherish your compassion. As a child cherishes the compassion of loving parents, we know that without your compassion, we would be reduced to nothing but dust on this planet, alive and growing one day and then dead and blown away with the wind the next, fading away even from human memories forever. But because of your compassion, Lord, we are allowed a life of eternity, a gift that you have promised even to future God-fearing generations. Help us and all future generations to hold tightly to your precious covenant through obedience to your will. Lord, from your mighty throne, rule over all of us. We call the cherubim that surround you and the seraphim that serve you and every believer in every area of this world to join our hearts in praising your most holy name. Amen. Well, good evening. If you would please take your Bibles and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to be continuing our series called By God. Now, in our sermon series on 1 Timothy, Paul has shifted back his focus to warning the church and warning Pastor Timothy about the false teachers. Uh, this last time when we looked about a month, almost a month ago, uh, at 1 Timothy chapter 4, the beginning of that chapter, we learned about spirit-led perseverance. Well, Paul is continuing uh, with that theme, but now he's specifically focusing upon Pastor Timothy's role. But it is still applicable to all believers. So I hope that we learn tonight that because God calls his people to persevere, we must train our words and works in godliness. That because God calls his people to persevere, we must train our words and our works in godliness. So hear the word of God now from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 9. If you put all these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irrelevant, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Amen. Please pray with me. Most Heavenly Father, we come to you this night and we are so grateful that we have this opportunity to hear from your word and to know that your spirit will speak to our hearts through your word. And we pray that you would effectively uh, minister to us, guide us and shape us and mold us more and more in the image of Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Have you ever noticed that someone is either a word person or an action person? Now, Jesus had it perfectly uh, together, right? He did his words perfectly and his works perfectly. But we tend to kind of fall in one category or another. But that's also the reason why we need the body of Christ, the church, because we need one another. Because if left to ourselves, we would uh, overemphasize our strengths and minimize our weaknesses. But we need one another because where I am weak, you are strong and I can depend upon you and vice versa. And so as we think about the way the body of Christ works together, the Lord shows the fullness of his character through his people as we minister uh, to one another. 
Now, as we think about the community of faith, uh, even while we are separate and we think about the ways uh, that God is calling us to try to build one another up uh, in this particular time, uh, we would just ask you to continue praying for wisdom and to be creative in ways that you can reach out to one another and use those gifts and talents and abilities to build one another up. It's just a wonderful way that we can do that. Even though we're limited, think of creative ways that God might use you in that way. Now, even though we are strong and we are weak in different ways, regardless of where we fall on that spectrum, every one of us need training so that we might be motivated and that we might be pointed in the right direction to bring glory to our great God. And so Paul teaches us to train our words and our works in godliness. Let's learn, first of all, to train our words in godliness. Look at verse 6 with me. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irrelevant, silly myths. Now, Paul starts out with Timothy telling him, if you put these things before the brothers, but what in the world are these things? Well, Every time you break up a letter into various sermons, right, you're going to have to connect them with what happened before. And so in verse 3, we know that Paul was trying to correct the errors uh, that were going on where these false teachers were forbidding uh, people to marry. Uh, They were requiring abstinence from foods that that God had given to us uh, to be enjoyed with thanksgiving. Now, these false teachers, they were not driven by love. But if we go back and look at the thrust of the Apostle Paul's uh, letter uh, to Timothy, you may be reminded uh, from the first chapter when he said, the aim of our charge is love that issues from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Now, we know that love will pour out from our lives even more clearly when we view ourselves as servants. Now, as Americans, that doesn't come very naturally to us. As biblical Christians, we speak about being servants, but most of us are not rich enough to actually have servants in our homes, and so we just think of it as theoretical. It's not very literal for us when we think about servants. But Paul motivated Timothy, and he presumed that Timothy valued being a faithful servant. Paul said, if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus. Now, as believers, all of us have been bought with a price. We are not our own. And because of that, that price that was paid was the life and the death of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He set us free from the bondage of sin and purchased us as bondservants of our Lord. And so to be a good servant, our lives must be shaped by the life-giving words of Jesus Christ. Now, when Jesus spoke, his words were the aroma of life. He uh, restored sinners' souls with his words. As Peter confessed, Christ alone has the words of eternal life. Do you remember when those words first revived your soul, bringing you from death to life? Now, not everyone has that dramatic conversion to Christ experience, but do you at least remember the time when you felt that deep conviction for your sin and your need for Christ, not just for sinners in general, but for you in particular? I need Christ because of my sin, because I need a Savior. Well, as we think about that, if you're one that has never come to Christ, if you are someone who's heard about him and maybe you've just tuned in, this is the very first time you're connecting with us at Redeemer, or maybe you've been here many, many times, and yet you have never turned from your sin and put your trust in Jesus Christ alone, then hear the call of God to you even now that you would come to Christ because there is no other Savior in the world or in the universe that could ever forgive you of your sin and take it away as Christ has and as he can. 
And so as we think about the way that Christ comes into our lives and the way that his life-giving words are a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, we have to recognize that these are the ways that we can only walk with the Lord is by the light of his word. But I'm guessing if you've been in church, uh, or at least in this world for very long at all, you have probably had the experience as well of life-giving words being eclipsed by the life-taking words of men. Now, a religious man really can't help himself but to try to add greater restraint to what people do with the intent of trying to obey God. And this rarely serves the people very well. Now, it all started with Adam. You may remember uh, when Eve told the serpent that we may not eat of the tree or touch it touch it. Where did she get that idea from? Well, Adam, of course, because Eve wasn't even created when that command was given. She never heard it, so she heard it from Adam. So when Adam told Eve about the forbidden tree, I picture him talking to her a little bit more like a child or how you would talk to a child about not going in the street. You know, you don't just tell the child, hey, don't play in the street. You probably hedge them from playing in the street, and you just say, you know what, why don't you just play in the fenced backyard? Adam probably said, listen, we can't eat from this tree. You know what, don't even touch it, right? He just hedges Eve from even going around the tree so that she would not eat from it. With good intentions, we try to hedge ourselves and others from danger, and we end up making a bigger deal out of our restrictive rules than about the life-giving words of Christ. Jesus always gives us the truth in love. Man has the tendency to distract from God's perfect words and his perfect love, and we are in danger of entirely losing what Paul called the words of the faith and the good doctrine. The Christian life is all about faith, so much so that we call the essential truths of Christianity the Christian faith. These are the basic set of essential doctrines or teachings that we are to believe to be rightly called a Christian or a Christ follower. Now, Paul said it even clearer in his second letter to Timothy in chapter 1. He says in verse 13, Follow the pattern of the sound words that you have heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. Sound words, the good deposit, the gospel. We have these promises of eternal life in Christ alone. And so we have to defend the faith and hold to the good doctrine. But that's kind of the rub, isn't it? How can we hold to the good doctrine without explaining ourselves? People used to say, I want no book but the Bible, no creed but Christ. Now, when they said that, they were oversimplifying their need for doctrinal standards with the hope of protecting people from majoring in minors. No book but the Bible? Are you talking about the 66 books of the Bible? Are you including the Apocrypha with that? Why or why not? You have to define what you mean by the Bible. Well, what about Christ? You say, no creed but Christ. Well, what do you say about his person and his work? Which Christ are you referring to? Are you referring to the one revealed in Scripture, or is it just a self-conceived and manageable notion of who you think Christ is? We must explain what we mean about what we believe in the Bible, and that's why having a confession of faith to summarize the main doctrines of the faith is very helpful to us. Now, to be clear, it does not have the same level of authority as the Word of God, but it does help us to explain what we mean about the Bible. By contrast, Paul calls us to avoid irrelevant and silly myths. 
Again, this is a word uh, that it would include for the people that are forbidding marriage and those that are forbidding certain kinds of food. But would it, it would include all sorts of fanciful beliefs where you know, someone takes some random verses and you know, spins some new doctrine from it that's completely irrelevant to the text. Cults are most famous for taking a vague verse and reading into it a whole bunch of things that are simply not there. This is why the Reformed doctrine of sola scriptura, or Scripture alone, is so important. It's about having our consciences bound by the Word of God alone. All the other things, they can be helpful, but they cannot replace the life-giving words of Christ And so as we think about Timothy, and we think about our pastors, and we think about you, and we think about all the things that God has called us to do to imitate Christ, we have to train ourselves in his word. Every time Christ met with people, he had some kind of teaching for them. His pattern was always to train people in godliness no matter what was happening. We need to think of creative ways to know him and to make him known in his, with his life-giving words. We need to be regular students of Scripture. Now, just because you went to Sunday school as a child does not mean you learned everything you're supposed to know about God's Word. Just participating in weekly worship doesn't mean you know everything that you need to know about God's Word. Our pattern should be one of regular communication with the Lord and about the Lord regarding both the great and small things of life. Now, we both or we should have times both of, that are formal and times that are informal in our training. Think about first formal types of training. The formal pattern that God gave to us, we even read it in the Ten Commandments, in the Fourth Commandment, right? God gave us one day in seven that we are to come and to be gathered together as much as we can given our circumstances, and to worship him uh, and to uh, bring the praise to him that he is worthy of. Sunday school was added to that, that we might also continue learning the faith and the good doctrine. We have weekly Bible studies and small groups as ways of encouraging one another to uh, learn and to live out the life-giving words of Christ. Now, If you are not currently part of a small group, but you would like to be, please talk to me. I would love to help you and train you in how to start one yourself with a group of other people. Now, you may also have times of family worship when you read, discuss Scripture, and pray together. There are all types of formal ways that we can keep ourselves trained in the words of godliness. But please listen. I did not say that Christian busyness is the same as godliness. The reason we commit to these regular gatherings of being nourished together in the life-giving words of Christ is so that we can focus on Him, not just more activity. But we also have times of informal learning. Now, parents need to supplement formal teaching times with trying to always find teachable moments. Now, sometimes something happens, and the way you respond to it may teach your children more things and be more memorable than 10 back-to-back classes on some kind of subject. But being in the Word regularly yourself, you will be more likely to have a verse that you recall at just the right time that you can share it with them relevant to a certain situation, or even to help restrain your fleshly response when you are provoked. When you use all of God's providence as an opportunity to learn about His goodness, then all of life can be filled with the joy of discovery. Now, when we compartmentalize our faith into our sacred and our secular categories, then we are breaking down the entire reason that Jesus came to give us new life. That he didn't come to just give us these formal times of Christian gatherings. He came to give us life eternal. That he is the center of all things. That's a Christian worldview. Understanding how he is the center of all and it all revolves around him. Maybe it would help if I compare it with good works. 
right? I don't think anybody would make the case that we should just only try to be obedient during our formal gatherings, right? You shouldn't do that because you're in church. Outside of church, you can lie, but not in church, right? It doesn't make any sense. Obviously, the Lord calls us to honor him in every relationship that we have. And so when you deal with your family, when you deal with your coworkers, when you are dealing with your neighbors or anybody else, we are called to represent Christ full time. And so learning to receive and then share the life-giving words of Christ at the right time is part of the beauty of godliness. But words are not enough. And so we learn next to train our works in godliness. Look at the end of verse 7. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Now, I've used the word godliness so many times in the last couple of months, I think I should probably at least define it for you. Godliness is a particular manner of life characterized by reverence toward God and respect for the beliefs and practices related to Him. Godliness is not a mere profession of faith. It's faith on display in a person's words and works. To make the goal of godliness more clear, we commonly use the synonym Christ-likeness. God made the purpose of all things to make us like Jesus. We read in Romans chapter 8, and we know that all those who love God or, and, we, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. Too often we quote verse 28 without quoting verse 29. Verse 29 defines the good. Right, All things work together for our good. It's not your definition of good. right? It's the definition of good in verse 29, which is conformity to Christ. We need training on a daily basis if we are to become more and more like Christ. Look at his life. He had the perfect display of words and works. His words even turned into works, just like at creation. When he spoke, the universe came into existence. And when he was on earth, Jesus spoke, and people were recreated, or they were healed of their diseases, or even raised from the dead. He is the Word of God incarnate. If Christ or in Christ, there is no separation from his words and works. He is that perfect balance of the two, and they worked perfectly in harmony with one another. And so for us to become like Christ, Scripture says it requires training. Yes, pastors should have formal and informal training to be able to faithfully lead the church. Officers need formal and informal training to effectively lead God's people. But every believer needs this training if you are to grow in Christ's likeness. The contrast Paul gave was with bodily training. Most likely, he is referring to the gymnasiums that were in the city of Ephesus. This was where the youth were taught art and sports and literature and drama. They labored diligently, as people do even today, to train their bodies for sport and for wellness. Paul acknowledges this is of some value. Yes, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we should be good stewards of the bodies that God gave us. The Lord is not only concerned about your soul, but your body as well. But when godliness is contrasted with the value of bodily training, Paul wants Timothy and the church to understand that godliness has unlimited value value. It holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. There is no situation in this life and in the one to come where Christ's likeness is not relevant or valuable. It's the goal of our existence when we prior, whether we prioritize our lives according to it or not. It's still the goal of our existence. 
Now, a dear friend sent me an article a while back um, called Inside America's Largest Religious Revival That You Know Nothing About. Heather Smith gave this religion the name Athletica in the same way that Paul contrasted bodily training with training in godliness, this author did the opposite. She looked at the way our country and its families handle athleticism as a religion with far more commitment from some people than their church experience. Forget one service a week, we have daily meetings, one title says. She writes, Athletic parents regularly begin teaching their children its basic skills as soon as they are able to toddle. And some begin their benevolent indoctrination well before that by dressing their infants in tiny versions of the liturgical vestments. I could go on and on, but you should just Google the article, Heather Smith, Athletica. She admits this popular religion does have a dark side. Alarmingly, it is not uncommon for those striving to advance through the ranks of Athletica to suffer chronic pain or serious injury from their devout exertions. However, it is a tribute to the depth of conviction Athletica elicits in some of its followers that this does not deter them from persisting in their daily routines. Almost universally, the response to such suffering is that it's simply part of the affliction that must be born in the Athletica life and that they endure such pain because of the glory for which they hope. Now, please don't misunderstand. I am all for sports. Our boys love sports, and we find them to be very helpful giving life lessons. But you read that article, and it's very convicting and, to, and causes us to question whether we are engaging in the same level of discipline in training our boys for godliness as we are in their athletic disciplines. Now, part of our training as believers is to add specific works and practices to our lives that reflect a life and love of Christ. Paul gives us his third trustworthy saying in this letter. Why does he do that? Why have trustworthy sayings among the church? Well, Paul knows that our thoughts influence our beliefs, and he knows that our beliefs determine our actions, and our actions form our habits, and our habits develop our traditions, and our traditions create culture. Now, actions are intentional, but habits become automatic for the individual. Traditions are intentional, but for a group that has all of those same things happening, and it's been enculturated, it becomes automatic for everyone. And so Paul wants the church to form a godly culture of discipleship. He wants us to pass down the faith through trustworthy sayings and confessions of faith. Imagine a world where the church is so trained in godliness, not just in words, but in works as well, that our individual habits as disciples and disciple makers bears great fruit in all of our relationships in the people that we influence. Our worship and our godly traditions of both the things we say and the things that we do, shaping a Christ-like culture of love that shows the world who Christ is in what we say, and in what we do. Brothers and sisters, this cannot be done with mere willpower, right? It's not just try harder to be like Jesus. That is not the message of God's Word. The Christian faith is exactly that. It's faith. It's about trusting in the promises that God has given to us. Jesus gave us his Holy Spirit to empower us to reflect his glory. Hear the promises of God, brothers and sisters, and believe. Philippians 2 says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Paul says, I am convinced of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion in the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come and acknowledge that 
we fall short, Lord, and, and thank you that Christianity is honest. Thank you that your word is true and that we don't have to just pretend to put on a facade of obedience. Lord, that it's all about coming to you right where we are, exactly where we are, and simply turning to you. Lord, forgive us for trying to put up a show. Forgive us for trying to just be something that we're not and help us to just walk with you, however mature, however immature, however uh, troubled, however uh, we struggle, Lord, whatever those issues are, Lord, help us to bring them all to you and know that you are working in them and through them and that you will redeem every failure so that you get all the glory for the way that you're molding and shaping us more and more in the image of Christ. And we pray it for his glory's sake. Amen. Well, we couldn't end uh, on a message giving us a faithful and trustworthy saying without using it as a confession of faith. And so if you would, please, where you are, stand with me and then recite with me uh, the words that are on the screen from 1 Timothy chapter 4. Have nothing to do with irrelevant, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Amen. Hear now 
the blessing, the benediction of our Heavenly Father. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with you all. Amen.